welcome to the Liberty Mike podcast, broadcasting from an undisclosed location in the heart of Dixie. I am Michael, and I'm here with Liberty Larry. How's it going? Doing all right. We are here. We are here. Didn't even get drinks. No, no. I should have I at least brought water in here, actually. <laughs> Mike's like, oh, I should have brought a water. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. We'll make it. Yeah, hopefully. Might have to Might have to make it short when... You know, my lips start smacking. It's time to call the end of the podcast. <laughs> Fair enough. <clears throat> um, so. Well, I, I mean, I figured that the first thing I want to say is something that I wanted to, well, meant to talk about on the last podcast and just completely forgot about. Um, it's a topic that's come up a few times in the course of our however long. We've been doing this almost two years now. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's the war on cash. Yeah. <laughs> and so there's there's been clearly a concerted push to get rid of cash because cash can't be tracked easily, um, but yeah. digital currency can. And uh, we'll probably get into this in a in a lot more detail sometime in the future because I'm trying to read up on this Fed Now stuff, the new digital oh. currency that the Fed is making. So and they're really? going to create um, accounts for everybody and like let let people use the post office as their bank, but Oh wow. They can... I haven't heard of this. I'd, I'd be interested. I'll have to do some digging. Yeah. This is all news to me. I haven't heard of that. Yeah. They're, I mean, they're talking about doing direct deposit to people, to people's accounts. Um, and, uh, they can control the interest. Well, actually they can, you, they can control the interest rate a lot tighter to control the inflation rate a lot tighter is the mm. idea. Also, because instead of, um, putting cash out into the market or into the banks. Um, they're putting cash out directly to the consumers. And so they think that that's going to, um, I mean, everybody could have their own account. That'd be pretty nifty. And then if you ever do something bad, they can just shut it down. <laughs> well, that's the funny thing is that they're, they've already talked about, um, like, you know, cause it's all uh, blockchain stuff and it'll have, um, restrictions on, on how the, um, money can be used to sell, or they can place restrictions yeah. on how the money can be used. You don't need to spend your money on that. And yeah. And they can like automatically withdraw like your rent and things like that. Yeah. And, and and they can put a barcode on you. So all you have to do is scan <laughs> it when sure. you go to pay. <laughs> well, like, you, you're jumping ahead a little bit, but <laughs> only a little bro. Like, yeah, I mean, no. not, not that far. Like if you think about it, I agree, but some other time for that. Um, <laughs> Yeah, but the war on cash ended when the storm hit. Yeah, Let me tell here. you, because, yeah, here, at least for a period of time, because we didn't have no power. Nobody had any power, really, at least for the first couple of days. Or internet. Or internet. Um, yeah, I mean, it was it was kind of, you paid cash. Yeah. <laughs> like, and that was, and it was tough. So, like, um, you know, I'm in retail, so because like you didn't have coins like we were had to move some money between some stores and stuff but like we figured it out <laughs> yeah well I, I i say like my thought was uh you know this um national coin shortage thing seemed to quickly disappear when uh, <laughs> sally came through like yeah we'll take your we'll take your cash yeah absolutely well, we'll take I've, your cash and even now even like today even like i still see pl uh, places with signs up cash only mm -hmm. like i mean it's not like it was like the right after the storm but yeah uh, which is crazy because those same places had please use debit mm -hmm. respect our space please use debit yeah. something like that you know mm -hmm. so it's it's weird watching it flip um, and that's the other crazy thing with the storm. Like everything COVID took a back burner oh, yeah. once the storm hit. Yeah, like what nobody pay any attention to some COVID stuff. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Masks were the least of people's oh, concerns yeah. all yeah. of a sudden. Exactly. Like I really would like to be able to eat today. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, it, it certainly had an interesting impact. But let it be a lesson to you all to keep some cash around. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, and I like I say, of course I always do. Like I, I do too. And I like I say, I don't carry as much cash as I'd like to, but mm -hmm. I've always got some available. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so. it's not like you were running up to the ATM no. after the storm either. Well, by that the was way. just it. Yeah, I mean, none of that stuff was an option if you hadn't uh, thought ahead before the storm. And there mm -hmm. were a lot of people um, that had some really rough days after the storm, mm -hmm. like just like you were saying, trying to figure out how to eat. Because nobody, like, at least for Ivan, people were somewhat prepared mm -hmm. um, and kind of thought ahead a little bit. But with this, nobody was prepared at all. And so people, like you say, like, I mean, the first few days were rough for some folks. Yeah. 
Uh-huh. Yeah, but the community came together. And they and, did. And uh, no, I wholeheartedly agree. But I'm just saying it was yeah. rough. <laughs> I mean, that was one of the nice things uh, about it. And and I, I hope it's not just a Southern thing. Um, but yeah. there was a lot of... Uh, there was a lot of community help going on. Oh, um, question. churches and all kinds of groups, uh, getting together. Um, mm. I, I mean, I had, when I was out, you know, dragging limbs across my front yard and so forth, uh, I had, um, some people in a truck, uh, stop on the side of the road and ask me if, uh, if I needed sandwiches or water or anything. Yeah. Um, I mean, that, that was, that was nice. Oh, yeah. Yeah, um, and there was a, you know, this church right around the corner from where I live, uh, they had every day, um, at 5 p.m., they were like free hot meals. Yep, they were doing that where I'm at too in Robertsdale. It was mm-hmm. um, every, and it wasn't just one. It was quite a few churches. I, you know, yeah, and they had people out at the road holding up signs. Yep. you know, need yep. a meal, come get it. You exactly, know? and that was for like two weeks. Yeah, um, and uh, everything's kind of settled back to normal. I even got internet back. <laughs> and you're so, not in the stone age anymore. No. So you're now I can tell you what I really think about media. <laughs> oh, all right. All right. <laughs> Maybe some do do a whole podcast on that in the future, right? <laughs> yeah, I don't I don't trust them just yet. We'll we'll, we'll let this uh, go on a little longer. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, well, okay. I don't think that we can. We're done with that, right? We're oh, yeah, moving on. Yeah, 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 I just wanted to bring it up. It's, yeah, it's, I, it's, I found it's it definitely interesting. Definitely worth mentioning for yeah. sure. Um, so we can't not talk about the debate. I oh mean, yeah, that that was. That was something else, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It so was, what? So what are your like just like overall thoughts of it? Um, I thought. Well, okay. So I'm glad I went back and listened to it a second time. Okay, or watched it a second time because yeah. the first time through, I just thought it was a fuster cluck. Yeah, uh, the, it <laughs> That's was a good way to describe it. It was just so much talking over each other and so forth. It was it was really pretty hard to listen to and there were some moments that i found particularly entertaining um and i think that i might have enjoyed the whole thing more if i was into like the jerry springer type (laughs) yeah that type of entertainment (laughs) yeah Yeah. um but i'm not so waiting for trump to grab a chair yeah it was it was just kind of frustrating really and uh, so my initial thoughts were like wow trump literally can't keep his mouth shut for two minutes yeah um, and, uh, and of course I did, well, and I felt like they didn't really cover anything of substance, but when I listened back through it, I was actually surprised at how much policy they actually, they actually did yeah. talk about. Um, I felt the same way. I mean, I list, I felt like they had talked a lot because uh, I listened to it twice too. And mm-hmm. the first time I listened to it live kind of broken up cause I was busy. Mm-hmm. So I listened a little bit in my car and I listened a little bit and watched a little bit in the house, but I was doing other things through a lot of it. So I went, I sat down and watched the whole thing again last night. Mm -hmm. Um, And I did feel like that there was, there was a lot of policy discussion. I mean, and the second time through the interrupting didn't, I guess I could tune it out a little better Mm -hmm. maybe, but the first time through, like it hurt my ears. Like, like it was, it was one of those things, like it was so cringe and so Mm -hmm. just, uh, it was hard (laughs) to Um, listen to. I think it, it is evidence that they've already won. In yeah. the sense of the political elites have ar- already won, that they can mm. put up these two terrible candidates, just like they did in 2016. The, yeah. the major parties can put up a terrible candidate, and they have you so afraid of what happens guy. if the other guy wins <laughs> that you'll vote for him. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. I was talking with some friends last night, and somebody told me that um, the uh, searches for alternative candidates went up like 10 times oh, yeah. um, after think, the debates that Joe Jorgensen was getting some traction and so forth. And well, I think her website like crashed from so much traffic or something. Oh, really? I may have, I may be mistaken about that, but I thought I read that somewhere. Yeah. I mean, it could be. Um, and so, uh, you know, one of the guys was saying, oh, well, you know, the, the, this could be the year for third party candidates. I said, no, I don't think so. It's I think not. they'll do worse than 2016. I, I think you're right. I think though, because, and I think the part of the reason for that is a lot of people just aren't going to go vote. I think that's going to be, I, and this is just my guess. I mean, partly because you're dealing with a lot of mailing and stuff, but mm-hmm. I think that you're going to see turnout be 
particularly low this cycle. Yeah. Uh, because you've got the two candidates. Nobody's. Ex- I mean, the Trump people are excited, but nobody's excited about Biden. Mm-hmm. And um, I just think turnout's going to be low. Yeah. Well, it doesn't. Turnout doesn't have to be big. Um, but I think that the real issue, I think the reason that third party candidates are going to do worse is because they've made such an issue out of the 2016 election being so close that the, you yeah. know, a few thousand votes in these few counties or whatever, yeah. um, could have swung the election. And I think that that actually drives people back into their camps. Oh, yeah. Um, so, you know, the guy that, that, uh, the Democrat who's like, I absolutely despise Hillary. And obviously there's no way I can vote for Trump that went out there and voted for Jill Stein or whatever last time around. Yeah. Um, He's like, oh, man, I didn't vote for Hillary last time and Trump got elected. Well, I, be- I have to go vote for Biden this time, even <laughs> though I think he's a doofus. Yeah. Um, but we can't have Trump again. And the same thing, same kind of... Vice uh, versa, yeah. Yeah, rationale is going on on the other side. So yeah. um, I think you'll end up with fewer third-party votes well, than 2016. And at least as far as the LP is concerned, they just haven't ran a good campaign. Yeah. I mean, I haven't- well, it's hard to run a good campaign when you're locked at home, too. That's true. That is very true. I, I, I'll. If you're them. not getting national media attention, yeah, um, then it's it's hard to do from home. That's true. I'll, I'll give you that one. At the same time, it's they just haven't been compelling. Though I don't think no, they've really done their job. I agree. But, We're focusing on the wrong thing. That was something that I was saying to the guys last night. Actually, is I, I said yeah. that. Um, this could have been a really good year, I think, for the LP because the the main things going on in American politics right now are things that the LP has had the right answer on for a long time. Oh, where yeah. It, with it really just coming down to individual liberty, um, yep. that people understand the risks and people can make their own risk assessments. And it's not the government's place to tell people where they can and can't go and whether they can run their business or not. Oh yeah. Um, and, and all they, they, if, if the LP had built a campaign around that message and just made that the founding tenant of the campaign, yeah. I think they could have made a lot of hay. Yeah. I mean, I really do. I think this could have been a, a I don't think we could have actually won per mm-hmm. se, but I think we could have got some of the numbers we've been talking about getting, you yeah. know, to, to start getting on debate stages and doing mm-hmm. some of that. I mean, I really do. I think if they had came out hard with that message, mm-hmm. um, that enough people would have got on board that it, something could have really been done. Well, I still don't think anything could have really been done because that debate is run by the uh, the, the commission on yeah. presidential debates. It's yeah. a government organization. They already but, have the power. They're not giving somebody else the opportunity. No. Um, and I think that the other issue, though, the other big issue about uh, you know police policing in this country yeah. is another one of those things that the Libertarian Party has been right about for a long time. That's true. Um, that, there, that there is an issue with accountability. Um, yeah. That you... Uh, there is a problem with militarization of the police. Yeah. Um, that, you know, there's... There is a problem with the drug war. There is a problem oh, yeah. that like the 1033 well, program that comes out of the um, overseas campaigns, but that yeah. gives the... Uh, the uh, police forces, all of this military equipment. And yeah. the worst thing about it is that the they have to show that they use that equipment within some period of time. It's like a, one or two years. Yeah. Um, and so it, you incentivize the police to use military equipment in their day-to-day operations to prove that they that are they using it, it and <laughs> yeah. they don't have to give it back. Absolutely. Yeah, so that's all a problem. I think, though, you could have really built a campaign around anti-lockdown, um, anti-war on drugs mm-hmm. and really built something that could have got at least a lot of attention yeah um, and maybe swayed some of the other candidates and made an impact mm-hmm. you know overall because I don't think Trump would have seeded that ground of anti-lockdown like I think if if there had been another voice that was trying to take that position mm-hmm. that he would have took that position harder yeah um, maybe maybe not well and I thought it was funny in the debate or strange in the debate that he took um, he took ownership of shutting down the economy. I had to shut down the greatest economy. It's like, well, I, I mean, <laughs> did you really yeah. do that? I right. mean, technically like, the States did that. Yeah. Um, yeah. like you made it a possibility. Yeah. Um, you did shut down some, uh, like a bunch of trade because you know, you're limiting things and people coming across the borders. But yeah, I mean, t- I, I was surprised that he took credit for that. Yeah. Um, no, that's true. 
And uh, that was one of the things that stood out. And of course, you know, one of the other things, as always, that that stood out at the debate is what they didn't talk about. Yeah. Um, and this on my first pass, like this is something that like, OK, so when are they going to talk about foreign policy? Yeah, I don't think they did it at all. Not at all. Ever. Yeah. No. Through the whole thing. Yeah. Um, not, not even once. in terms of trade or anything like they didn't talk about foreign policy at all. Yeah. Um, and the other thing that they didn't talk about was the national debt. Yeah, never came up. Well, and that's, I tell you, that's, uh, neither candidate has an incentive to talk about that one. Because yeah, well, yeah. Trump's already in office now, and he doesn't want to talk about what he's done since he's been there. Yeah. And of course, Biden's got nothing positive to say about that either. Yeah. Oh, and it must be said that, uh, that Chris Wallace was a terrible moderator. Oh, yeah. That was the other thing I was going to mention was that, yeah, that was, he was like, I, so I was, by the end of it, I was more irritated with him than I was with any, either of the two candidates yeah. i mean I, I felt like at least the candidates had a right to have their moment and say something but mm -hmm. he, he was just a oh man yeah he he shut them down at odd times yep. uh he didn't he didn't force questions to be answered he didn't i mean there was one th point where he was introducing the new topic i i think it was well trump was going on and on about whatever the previous topic had been yeah and chris wallace wanted to move on to race and he said, well, I'm going to ask a question. It's going to be about race, but you can talk about whatever you want. What, are you, <laughs> what, what kind of moderation for a yeah. debate is that? Of course, these aren't really debates. I mean, they're not. Yeah. They're, they're created to create a, I mean, they're, they're done to create a whole bunch of like just little talking point things yeah. um, without, uh, without a lot of substance. Now, while I yeah. think that it was more substantive than most people gave it credit for, yeah. It's not like it's, there was a lot of detail. Yeah, it's not like they had long stretches to come up with philosophical arguments. Yeah, to, there's no nuance. Yeah, exactly. Um, and uh, I think that they, Chris Wallace could have done better maybe defining what open discussion meant. <laughs> yeah. Because um, uh, there was a point where he actually said, this is open discussion, so be quiet and let him talk. Wait. <laughs> what what do you think open discussion means? Because right. <laughs> uh, oh. now I'm really confused. Yeah. Um, but there were some interesting moments uh, in it. Um, I think uh, I think most of them. Well, okay. So, what do you think in general of what I think was a strategy of Trump's yeah. uh, to interrupt and and well, uh, so actually let me point out before we get into all this interruption thing yeah. that the first person to interrupt was joe biden yeah you told me to look out for that when i re-listened to it and mm -hmm. you were absolutely correct he was he he started that whole mm -hmm. process there yeah i'm going to, to talk over you yeah, yeah yeah and let me tell you you're not going to talk over trump i no. mean you're just especially joe biden like maybe if you had another <laughs> candidate up there that was a little more brash but you're not he joe biden ain't winning that battle let me yeah. tell you yeah um but I, I do think that that was a strategy of trump that he was he knows the guy's flimsy mm -hmm. and that he his his idea was well if i keep putting him on the spot and keep just talking over him and i'll i'll make him screw up yeah um and i'm gonna rattle him rattle him yeah, yeah absolutely and i um and i think that it could have worked really well if he had gave him enough time to do it. It felt like every time Biden was fixing to have one of those moments where he was going to collapse, Trump would jump back in and mm -hmm. give him, you have to give him, you have to kind of push him there, but give him enough rope to hang himself. Yeah. And, and, he, yeah. and Trump never gave him that opportunity. Anytime where it looked like that was fixing to happen, Trump would jump back in and mm -hmm. it, 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 it save him more than anything. Yeah. So. I, I think that, I think that you have a point there. Um, I, uh, so that wasn't what I thought when I listened to it at first. Oh yeah. Um, I mean, I, I thought it was a strategy, but I didn't, yeah. I, I, it didn't occur to me that he was actually saving him. Yeah. Um, although I heard some people, uh, some commentators talking about how, um, you know, Trump lost his composure and so forth. And I, I thought, well, that uh, I disagree with that. I, I mean, I, I don't think that. I think yeah. that he was under control. I think he knew exactly what he was doing. He knew what he was doing. Yeah, yeah. he was trying to get um, him to stumble. I mean, the guy is just kind of, uh, you know, boisterous and um, yeah. and uh, uh, antagonistic anyway. Um, yeah. So I, I didn't I didn't think it was something where he lost it. Yeah. I never, I never really saw that point. And I thought no. that Joe Biden did a, a oh, couple yeah. of times. Yeah. Um, 
Especially when they were talking about his son with the Burisma stuff. Yeah. Like you could tell like that was that was definitely some openings there where if Trump had like let it go enough, I think mm-hmm. that Biden could have collapsed right there. Like, yeah. I mean, it was just, it was, it clearly got to Biden. Yeah. Well, and I think that he actually made a startling admission there on stage when he said that, you know, his, his son had drug problems and, um, yeah. and so forth. Um, uh, but my, my first thought about the interruptions is that, and I don't know if this is positive or negative for Joe Biden, but it, I thought that it made, um, Joe Biden into a sympathetic figure. Yeah. Um, now, (laughs) now that being said, uh, I don't know if like the whole of America wants to elect a president that they feel sorry for, that they feel was getting bullied. Yeah. Um, I I don't think that that's what you want in a president. I think that's where the kind of the alpha kind of takes over. Like, Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you want, you want whoever the alpha is. You don't, you don't want the, you're you're not you're not running to go vote for the guy you feel sorry for. Yeah. Um. And and you got to remember, like Joe Biden, as much as nobody, at least nobody I know, really believed him when he was saying that that was his thing. He's like, oh, I will destroy Trump on that debate stage. Like mm-hmm. he said that over and over again. He wants that opportunity to be on the stage with the, with Trump. Yeah. And. I mean, you saw it. You take what you want from it, but I'm just saying. Well, he did better than I expected him to, he, um, but they both performed poorly. Oh, well, absolutely. Um, and then, of course, the moderation was even worse. So, yeah. I mean, and it, part of it, I mean, part of the reason that they both performed poorly might be because the moderation was so bad. It could be. Uh, but it's hard to say. And I don't, I don't think that, that being a sympathetic figure is really positive. Uh, for Joe Biden. Um, one thing was certain is through all of that, even all of them talking over each other and interrupting and so forth. I did get the impression that like Trump was the guy in charge. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. And, and I think that that does nothing but help his cause. Um, I think at the end of the day that that's going to bring his supporters out and I mean, did you see anything from Joe Biden that's going to bring Joe Biden supporters out? Because at the end of the day, that's what you're trying to do is rally your base to get them to the polls. Yeah, that's true. Um, I mean, maybe maybe people hating Trump enough and seeing Trump up there will drive those people, anti-Trump mm-hmm. people, to the polls. But I don't know. I think you're betting on a long shot there. Yeah. Well, and so shifting a little bit here, the big news from the debate was uh, Trump refuses to... What what's the word that they use? I don't remember. Oh, about um, the white denounce national. denounce white nationalism yeah, or whatever, yeah. and that's just garbage. I mean, when <laughs> I listened to it again last night, and I mean, he he straight up says when Chris Wallace asks, "Sure, I'll I'll denounce anybody you want." Yeah, you know, I mean, mm-hmm. and, and to me, that's tell me even, what you want me to call them. Yeah, exactly, yeah. and mm-hmm. that was. <laughs> and that just killed me, uh, Biden over there. The Proud Boys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, like of proud. all the obscure groups to pick, like yeah. how that was the one. I just don't know. That's hardly a white nationalist group. You might no. make the argument that it's kind of misogynist. I but. would maybe, <laughs> but I would argue that there's, and I don't know. I hadn't seen the numbers. I've never been to a rally, so mm-hmm. I don't know. But I would wager there's more black people in the Proud Boys than there is Antifa. Yeah, you might be tr- you might be right. I have no idea. I have no idea. I'm just saying just from from living in the south, I just feel like that that's something you would see. I don't know. I could be completely off. I don't yeah. know. Um I mean it was, it was started by that guy that used to be at Vice, right? When he at- I think so, but I'm not sure. I know um, I know Dave Irish Smith name. talks I can't about remember. him a bunch. Yeah, Irish name. Him. I can't remember I can't remember his name. But anyway, like it was kind of a joke as I understood it, but it was about yeah you know, being a man again in yeah. this day and age where um, <laughs> manliness is kind of... Um, Frowned upon. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so, and it, it drew a lot of support because of that. Like, yeah. Um, but even then, it wasn't a lot of support. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it just, this isn't a big group. Like, yeah. they don't have chapters all over the nation. At least not yet. They and may of course, after the, this. the premise is BS anyway. But yeah, you're right. So when um, Chris Wallace brought it up, he said, yeah, sure. Absolutely. Sure. Yeah. Um, what do you want me to call him? Whatever. And like this 
stand back and stand down or whatever. That, that yeah. was probably That's, not the best way of it. It of absolutely the wasn't. But, but at the same time, uh, and we should all be used to listening to Trump speak. Mm-hmm. He speaks oddly, like mm-hmm. he puts words together weird. Yeah, and, and then he just shifted it to well, the left is more of a problem, and well, somebody yeah. needs well, to put down Well, he just shifted Antifa gears and, after that. Yeah. yeah, I mean, he said that, and then he just shifted gears. But I don't. You can. The way he speaks, you can read too much into stuff he says, mm-hmm. and which that's part of what the left, the problem, left, what the pro- left has a problem with is mm-hmm. that they read in too deep to what he says. Yeah, and you you got to just kind of take it. All these dog whistles. Well, yeah, and that's what they say, <laughs> but I mean, yeah, it's just crazy talk. Well, and even so, I, I went looking for the clip today, uh, yeah. the original, his statement after the Charlottesville incident. Oh, yeah. So, we could play the whole thing. And I think we have on the show before, but maybe not. I think we have too, if I'm not mistaken, but I don't know. Um, I couldn't find it in the clips that I've used and I, I couldn't find it online. Oh, um, wow. At least not in a way that I could easily uh, it. consume it. Yeah. yeah. Um, in the, like, like an hour ago <laughs> <laughs> yeah. when I was doing it. But uh, anyway, the, there was a point where Joe Biden said, well, you know, and he was talking about these people that were violently out there. And he said that they're very fine people uh, on both sides. And you can hear Trump barely in the background saying, um, read the rest of the quote or something yeah, like that. He does. So, I, yeah, Trump did. He That's actually exactly what he said. He was like, if you're going to read it, read the rest is what mm-hmm. he says. Something like that. Yeah. Um. But but then they, they just kind of moved past it, and mm-hmm. Trump didn't really like forcibly force the issue. Yeah, he should have just so. said, "This is what I said yeah, again." It is that I was talking specifically about the people that were there protesting for and against having the statues up, and I specifically said beforehand that I wasn't talking about the white nationalist groups yeah. or the white supremacists when I said this. All you I was have talking to do is about listen. the people that were protesting about the statues, and yeah. that there were very fine people on both sides. Yep. And if if you watch the quote, there's no way you take it any other way than just that. Like, yeah. this has been debunked so many times. Yeah. Like, it's so frustrating. I mean, but the media clips it very specifically to leave that out. Oh, yeah. And uh, and the whole, uh, you know, it's it was amazing to me, talking about Chris Wallace just doing a horrible job of moderating. Yeah. Um, it was amazing to me how frequently he let Joe Biden not answer a question. Yeah. Um, or uh, shut Trump down when Trump asked a question and Joe Biden was not answering it, and okay. Trump kept insisting that on do. the question again. Yeah. And Chris Wallace said, "Well, you've you've made a point here. Let him answer it." And then he let Joe Biden not answer not it. Not answer it. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so a couple of examples of that, and some of them were just <laughs> like obscene. Yeah. How how. Slanted. absurd it was yeah. um the when he was asking about uh packing the court and the filibuster oh, stuff yeah. yeah and uh joe literally refused to answer the question oh yeah no he he sidestepped that completely like, yeah blatantly. he said well i'm not going to answer that because whatever answer i give that becomes the story well yeah that's yeah. why you're here that's the idea like <laughs> yeah. to get you on the record and that's that's all trump, trump was trying to do is get him on the record but he wasn't having that yeah i mean there was another point where uh trump was pressing something and and um, Chris Wallace stops him and says, let, let him answer the question. And uh, Joe says, well, he refuses to let me answer the question because he knows I have the truth. But then he proceeds to not <laughs> give any additional information. Yeah, exactly. Well, I mean, I, I don't know. Yeah. There was. I think that was in reference to the Burisma stuff, right? Might have been. I think it was. Yeah. yeah. I, I didn't. I don't remember. I just remember yeah. this moment where I was like, well, what the? <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty sure because it came up twice in the debate the, because, because Trump brought it up twice, like mm-hmm. um, kept interjecting that. Yeah. And I think the time, one of the, at least one of the times you're referring to, that's what it was. Well, and then there was the point where Chris Wallace tries to move off of that. And he says, well, I think the American people would prefer that we deal with something more substantive. Or something. Why? Well, I think yeah. corruption last time he was in government is kind of substantive. <laughs> it I, absolutely is. Um, right. <laughs> I, I'm I'm interested in how he answers yeah. these questions of corruption when he was vice president, and we're thinking about making him the president. Exactly. Um, I, I think that that's 
I think that that's relevant. Absolutely. But it is funny because nobody but Trump would ever bring any of that up. Or, oh, I know. And, and that's what makes it so entertaining because you know if, if it was Mitt Romney or any of the rest of them out there, they would We're not going to talk about his family. We're not going to talk about that. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. Certain things are off limits. <laughs> mm-hmm. Not with Trump. No, not with Trump, that's, no. That's it's, absolutely it's no true. holds barred. And that's barred. why nobody's prepared for him. Yeah. Um, there <laughs> some other moments that we... Uh, that I thought were funny that um, Trump was pressing about uh, name one law enforcement group that supported you. And oh <laughs> yeah. Na- just name one, name one law enforcement group that supported you. And Joe says, we don't have time for that or something. <laughs> yeah, like he that. does. And Trump's like, we got an hour and a half. We got all the time you want. Take <laughs> yeah. your time. <laughs> yeah. One group. We don't have time for that. I yeah. don't know. Oh. Um, and then, uh, and that was in the same thing where they were talking about racial injustices and so forth. And yeah. um, Joe made the statement that there is systemic injustice in education, work, and law enforcement. Yeah. Okay. So I'm not going to debate whether there's sy- systemic injustice in these things, but I will point out that two of those three things, education and law enforcement, are both government groups. Yeah, exactly. Kind of, the government that he was a part of for 47 years. And yeah. that's a point that Trump kept making. And Oh, yeah. yeah. And I think it's well heard. I mean, this guy's had plenty of time to, to if he wanted to fix these things, he's been <laughs> in government a long time. Yeah, and he said, uh, when pressed on it specifically that, he says, uh, well, I, I didn't fix it because you weren't president then screwing things up. <laughs> <laughs> you're the, and then he's that's when he made the statement I think that you're the yeah. worst president that we've ever had yeah. and as long as we're talking about insults that like there were a couple of them from Trump yeah. um, there was the nobody wants to go to your rallies yeah. and uh, don't oh, I, I was rolling <laughs> yeah, man <laughs> I thought that was funny too and uh, the you know don't use the word smart with me there's nothing oh, smart about you yeah I thought that was good and I thought uh, that was kind of fitting uh-huh. just because you know Joe Biden is Joe Biden. I don't know. It just, it was funny. Yeah. And the, but Joe Biden was the one that was doing the, like the real personal attacks that, yeah. um, Joe Biden is the one that called him a clown that called him a racist. They called him a liar. Yeah. I mean, there were like real specific personal attacks, um, <laughs> on against Trump that were, I, I thought, I thought that they were more egregious than anything that Trump said to Biden. Yeah. Yeah, um, I mean, if you're trying to maintain this facade that there's some kind of civility in this anyway, yeah. which um, is garbage, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. even still though, like if that's, yeah, if you're supposed to be the bigger candidate, mm-hmm. like that's not, he, he wasn't doing it. Yeah. And I think it's, I think it's funny that people feel like they have to do that with Trump. Um, and yeah. I get why to some degree, like he spends all this time on Twitter, or, you know, when he's doing his rallies or in press statements or whatever, attacking, yeah. um, his opponents, uh, that you feel like, well, now you got the stage, you need to attack him too. Yeah. But then you do, and he's just better at it. Oh yeah. He's gonna, yeah. You don't want to, you don't want to play that game with him. Yeah. Like. And the funny thing is that even through all the interruptions, like if you're paying attention to the insults, Trump seemed to be the better man in this one. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's absolutely true. If you can look past all the interrupting. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but but as far as like just mudslinging, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah. Um, and, you know, somebody last night was saying to me, one, one of my friends last night was saying that, uh, you know, regardless of what you think of the guy, the office deserves some respect. I don't agree with that. I don't agree with that either. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. Um, and but, maybe that's just the the anarchist in me that wants to burn all of us down. Yeah. That's kind of what I've always attributed it to, but <laughs> I don't know. I just I don't have that I've never had that much respect for the office. Yeah, so. title title doesn't mean anything to me. You're going yeah. back to an aristocracy thing where you're better just because you've got whatever. Yeah. Uh, because you've got this title. Exactly. Um and I, I, don't, I, I don't I don't Put any stock that. in yeah. any yeah. in that. Um there was another moment where it seemed like Joe thought that he was being insulted. Um, and I don't think that Trump was actually insulting him Well, not in, at least not in the way that, that it seemed like Joe took it. Um, there was a point where Trump says something that sounds like you're number two, Joe. Um, and, and Joe's like, Oh, you know, get a load of this guy or whatever. Something like that. Yeah. And, uh, what, when I listened to it the second time, I actually backed up and listened to it again because I thought, wait, no, I don't think that's what's going on. I don't think that he's calling him number two. Oh, yeah. Um, cause what it, 
it sounded like happened to me is that uh, Joe was listing reasons about whatever it was that they were talking about. Yeah. And he's like, uh, you know, blah, 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 blah. That's number one. Um, number two and number three. And he doesn't say anything for number two. And I think that what Trump said is you're on number two, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> trying to help him keep up with what number he's on. Yeah. <laughs> or point out the fact that he just like skipped number skip two. two. Yeah. <laughs> Didn't actually give a reason. I, I gave three reasons and one of them was blank. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> um, oh, that's funny. Yeah. I, and I, I thought it was funny too, but I mean, I don't have a whole lot more to say about the debate there. There was yeah. one other, I thought, um, really interesting moment. Um, and that's when uh, they were talking about the election and the transfer of power. Yeah. And, uh, well, okay, so maybe two more two more moments, because there was a COVID moment that I, I want to address also. But um, when they were talking about the election and the transfer of power, and Trump made the statement that they've never actually transferred power to him. Yeah. And I thought that that was actually really insightful. I, yeah. Because um, we've been making that argument, actually, for, for a long as long as time. we've been doing this podcast. Yeah. And I, I was going to say the same thing. I kind of, well, I appreciated the fact that that's where he took that mm -hmm. that line of questioning. Yeah. Um, and I've never really thought of it that way. Like, I mean, it never occurred to me to kind of frame it in that manner. Mm -hmm. But I think he'd made a, I mean, if you kind of know the background and stuff, I think he made a pretty good argument. Yeah, like, I do too. I think there's an argument to be made there for sure. Yeah. Um, and I, I appreciated the fact that that was kind of where he took it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I thought that that was a, a very witty and insightful response to that. Yeah. No, um, I absolutely agree. And just so that everybody knows, they keep talking about these mail-in ballots like they're the same as absentee ballots, and they're not. Yeah. This is not well, the same process. And Trump tried to explain that. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, and I thought, I mean, through, through Trump language, that he did a pretty good job of doing it. That Well, that's the problem. <laughs> it was through Trump language. <laughs> yeah. But, I mean, if you if you really listen to what he was saying, I mean, he made he made the argument, you mm -hmm. know. I mean, there's a difference. I forget what is it called. There's a difference between a solicited ballot where you ask for one, yeah. they send it back to you, and then you send it back. And then just sending a mass of ballots. Mailing though. ballots to everybody, yeah. like. I mean, you can't tell me there's not going to be fraud when everybody got a ballot in the mail. Yeah. Oh, um, I hate to go back to this, but sure. I feel like it's an uh, it's an important point that we kind of brushed over. What was the bit where Biden said that Antifa is just an idea, not an organization? <laughs> right. <laughs> Pretty sure they have a website. Um, I mean, I like. Well, they're absolutely just to put anybody's mind at ease that thinks that that's the case. They're out there, man. Like, yeah. they're out there beating people I up. I mean, it's a loose affiliation, but there is a, an organization. There is too. an organization. Yeah. I mean, they have, and they're probably way more organized. It's like than, a terrorist cell. Yeah, well, I would, I would <laughs> gather, though, they're more organized than the Proud Boys. Yeah, that's probably true. <laughs> um, just saying. Yeah, uh, that's probably so. true. Um, so uh, on the COVID thing, uh, man, did they argue back and forth about that? And I don't know what uh, we've talked about that COVID so much, but yeah. uh, something that the president said that I really liked, and I and it's the uh, again the position that we've been promoting here um, is there was a moment where he said people know what to do, yeah, to wash their hands, wear a mask, do what they can to protect themselves. People know what to do, and they'll do it. Yeah. Uh, and I think that I, I thought that was, he actually did really good with that argument because because mm -hmm. um, he said that and and he and he was talking about reopening the economy. Yes. And that that if we reopen the economy, people know how to act and know how to respond, and mm -hmm. they will do it. Yeah. Um. And I think there's a compelling argument there. Now I know we had we had really, to be draconian at the beginning because we didn't understand the infection. We've learned a lot since then. People yeah. know what to do. Yeah. yeah. And there's and and I think there's a strong argument there, and I thought mm -hmm. he did a pretty good job. Mm -hmm. Um. I, we hadn't really gotten to it yet, and I don't know if we planned on really talking about it, but, you know, Co Trump's been diagnosed with COVID, mm. and so he's been putting out some videos periodically. I watched one yesterday. Um, I'd heard where, about it, but I haven't been tracking it, so you um, you certainly well, know more about this. Well, I just, the reason I wanted to mention it is because it, it touches on kind of what the argument he was making there, the, mm -hmm. the, the one video I watched yesterday, um, which is from him in the hospital, and they've got him in a little room in there, like mm -hmm. a little office, and... Um, so he was talking, and what he was saying was that you know he had, when all of this started, that he had a choice mm -hmm. to either 
and what people wanted him to do, bunker down, stay at the White House, not have anybody over, mm-hmm. and, and hunker down. And basically he said, that's not what leaders do. Mm-hmm. Leaders go out and do what they're supposed to do and do their job. Mm-hmm. And he was like, and I made a decision early on, that's what I was going to do. Um, and he was and kind of making the point that, you know, this may be the consequences of that, but I don't regret doing it. Yeah. Um, so, okay, that's interesting. So they have him, like, set up with a little office, so he's working and making phone calls and yeah. doing so that things was, while Yeah, so that was there. the argument for him because he's not, according to – there's – there's some disputing how about the information that's being given to the press mm-hmm. as far as his health condition. Yeah. But I'll tell you this. He's up walking around like he walked to airport or to the helicopter the other day. That's Marine One. Marine One. Yes, yes, Marine. So he walked to Marine One. like so, And they've got him in an office or he has access to an office mm-hmm. that he's putting out videos from. Yeah. Um, he looks fine. He sounds fine. He's not like coughing and making a bunch of noise. Yeah. Um, and he seems good. Um, but yeah, that's, but, and that, but the reason that they wanted him at the hospital instead of at the white house is because they, ha- he has all that set up there. So he's not mm-hmm. dealing with the public. They can quarantine him and he can still do his job. Yeah. It's easier to control the environment. I exactly. Think. Than it is at the white house. Well, I, so I've only heard news stories and, um, and it comes out as a, you know, Trump's been in the hospital for three days now with COVID and it makes it sound like. Like he's, like he's in, in the hospital. ICU bed. Yeah, yeah. exactly. That's yeah. not the case at all. Um, mm-hmm. So I've seen I've seen a couple of it. I think he's put out two so far. So it's not. I ex- I anticipate this to be a regular thing that he does as long as he stays there. Yeah. Although who knows, he may leave tomorrow. Like there's talk that he may not stay there anymore. Mm-hmm. I, but the first couple of days are supposed to be crucial with because he is in a high risk group. Right. With his age and his weight. Mm-hmm. So I mean we'll know in a few days kind of where he's at with it, if this is going to be a severe case or if he's going to kind of breeze through this. Mm -hmm. I will say my biggest fear with this is that he ends up with a severe case, and if something does end up happening to him, which I hope, for one, I hope doesn't happen. I wouldn't want that on anybody. Mm -hmm. Um, But I also hope that doesn't happen because I worry about what will happen to the anti-lockdown movement Yeah, if Trump was to die of COVID. Um, yeah, because that 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 worries me because then you end up with the situation of a president dying of this virus, mm-hmm. and I think that the lockdown movement will just like take over. Yeah, yeah, you're probably right. Um, I don't think there's a high risk of that because once again, this is a virus that even with high risk being in a high risk group, people tend to survive. Yeah. I mean, it's it's still a low death rate. From, yeah, even the but, high risk group, it's like five percent or something, right? Yeah. Like the highest risk groups, exactly. or age group, anyway. age groups. Yeah, yeah. So I don't think that we've got a lot to worry about there, but I do worry about it. Mm-hmm. Well, it's something to be worried about. Um, I mean, we'll we'll keep an eye on this. I'm sure that this will be news over and over again until it's all done. Oh yeah. Um, some one other thing before, because I know we're probably getting ready to move on past the debates. Mm-hmm. But I did want to ask you one question as far as just Biden in general. Okay. So, do you think they had him doped up? Oh, I have no idea. Yeah, I don't know. So, watching it the first time through, like I kept looking at his eyes, mm-hmm. and it he just had that look. I remember this look from when people were on acid, like where their <laughs> eyes are just like bugging out of their head. Yeah. I kind of felt like that's how he looked. Uh, now, I'm not saying they had him doped up on anything. I don't know. I have no way to know. Yeah. But I'm just saying. I, I didn't really pay any attention to that. I mean, I, you he, know, a lot of the time I wasn't even really watching it. I was just yeah. listening. So I noticed that more of the first time through than the second when mm-hmm. I watched it. And I actually watched it all the way through the second time. Um, but... I don't know when I the, the little bit of it that I did watch when I was um the first time through it just his eyes looked like they were like mm-hmm. bugging out man interesting <laughs> well uh speaking of acid <laughs> <laughs> maybe um there's just a couple more topics that I wanted to hit and um you know hopefully we can use some international news to talk about something that that matters closer to home uh one of them is the Alexei Navalny thing that's been going on between Germany and Russia and the OPCW and, you know, and the West, I guess, generally. Yeah. Um, this has been ongoing. So for those that, that don't know, uh, Alexei Navalny is a, is an opposition figure in Russia. And um, he uh, came down with some kind of severe illness or something on a plane 
um, in uh, like southeast Russia, more or less, south to southeast Russia. Anyway, they um, ended up rushing him to a hospital in Omsk in Russia, uh, where he was stabilized and then transferred out to Germany. Uh, now, the what makes the story interesting is that the Russians did um, toxicology and came up negative. They didn't find any uh, any trace of any kind of no, um, no Novichok. Yeah, Novichok. Novichok. Yeah. Uh, any trace of any kind of poison or anything in his system. But then Germany, um, when they got him, uh, they released a re- well they didn't release the report they made a statement that they had found traces of novichok in his system yeah which is a um a nerve agent that was developed in the soviet union in like the 70s or something yeah and um and the mainstream media would have you believe is classic russia yes yes like that's that's been the that's been the coverage i've seen here is that this is just classic russia yeah. this is what they do and you may remember this from a couple of years ago the guy that died in the uk uh, Skripka or whatever i can't remember his name now but it was the same yeah. thing novichok was found in a system obviously the russian it was a russian agent that poisoned this guy etc yeah um now all of this is at least to the public is without evidence yeah. um now what Germany did was that they turned over the results to the OPCW, the Organization for the Prevention of Chemical Weapons, yeah. um, who you may remember that we've talked about before as being a primarily political organization at this point that can be influenced by some um, members of the UN and so forth to produce results that feeds their narrative. It doesn't exactly fit the facts. <laughs> and there's been some people that have... Uh, either resigned or been fired from the OPCW um, or that were working as contractors and aren't being asked back or, you know, that kind of thing uh, reports that their um, information, which was professional information, like people that know their job well uh, was completely ignored in reports that were put out. Primarily we talked about it in terms of the Syrian chemical weapon stuff. Yeah. All right. So, um, We'll just say that the OPCW has a checkered past. They're not. They're not the most credible. <laughs> um, now that being said, so does Russia. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. Um, and what Germany? So Russia asked that the information be released to them. Yeah. And uh, Germany hasn't done so. Um, initially, they said they would, but then they didn't, um, and they turned everything over to the OPCW. Now, by letter of the law, they're doing it the way they're supposed to do it. This is this yeah. is the bureaucracy built around this thing. They also turned it over to, I believe, the UK and France. No, no, Sweden and France uh, to do testing as well. Okay. Um, and I, I I feel like I saw a notification that the uh, Sweden and France had verified the German results, but I'm not sure what that means. Did they turn over... Uh, untested samples um, where uh, there's no, I mean, they yeah. couldn't have drawn it directly from Alexei Navalny. It would have been too late. Yeah. So I, I'm not sure. Exactly. The logistics you know, here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but anyway, there are certainly questions about whether it could have been, it, it was actually the Russian state that did any of this. Yeah. And one of the big ones is that um, Novichok is a really powerful nerve agent. Yeah. And uh, now there are different types uh, or, you know, methods, Grades. I guess, or, yeah. yeah. Um, but for the most part, uh, Novichok uh, acts pretty quickly. And while there are um, versions that are stable at, uh, um, that are more stable, the um, chemical itself will evaporate at room temperature. Like it, it yeah. boils off at room temperature. And so the story is that he was poisoned. Um, well, this is where it kind of falls <laughs> apart. Initially, yeah. the story was that he was poisoned on the plane. Yeah. Um, but that's because it, it'll evaporate at room temperature and nobody else on the plane was affected. Uh, this is questionable. Yeah. Like it seems dubious. So he may have had to come in contact with somebody that had it maybe that are that it somehow passed it to him. I mean, I don't know how this really works. Yeah, so. I mean, it's it's a possibility, but the chances of being able to uh, not affect pass it him to other people and not have his like the person sitting next to him on the plane also be affected, you gotcha. know, that kind of thing, gotcha. would okay. have been yeah. 
could have been difficult. Yeah. Um, so, but then the story is that, uh, they tested uh, like a wine bottle or something from his hotel before he, he got on the plane. Um, and this is dubious because, um, like I said, the, the drug for the most part or the chemical for the most part acts very quickly. Um, and it's a four hour flight. Yeah. Plus lead time to get to the from the hotel to the airport, go through security. I assume they have some kind of security in Russia <laughs> right. uh, at, on, yeah. at their airports, et cetera. Yeah. So, I mean, that just seems questionable, too. Now, I don't understand all of this stuff well enough to make any, you know, de- judgments, real declarative statements about this. But yeah. these are just some things to consider yeah. besides the fact that it, it to me, it reeks of the same kind of thing as like a. Well, um, we know that the Russians hacked into the DNC computers because they left uh, code in Cyrillic. <laughs> like, it, it's, yeah. you know, it, I don't know. It's so blatant that it just kind of seems question. unlikely. And it doesn't help anybody. Um, I mean, nobody really gains from this, except that the, the West, and particularly the, the U.S., um, immediately started pushing Germany uh, to cancel the Nord Stream 2 pipeline from that delivers that is to deliver um, gas Russian gas to uh, Germany and then through Germany to the rest of Europe. Oh, okay. So follow the money. Yeah, exactly. And the the U.S. is now producing excess um, natural gas that they're looking for buyers, you know, yeah. and so they want to transport liquid natural gas to Europe and and they want to be the seller. Um, and, you know, another thing that's just kind of interesting about this is that the, the creation or the establishment of the Nord Stream 2 pipeline isn't actually going to change the amount of Russian gas that's being transported to Europe. Just the um, method. Yeah, just the method. The way the pipeline that it's going through now goes through Ukraine. Ah, wow. And we've had some interest in Ukraine in the past. <laughs> yeah. I should have looked up the episode. We got a we got a really good episode on Ukraine um, several months ago. Yeah, and uh, so anyway, these are just some things to think about. But the point here is that is the follow the money point. Yeah, like okay, if you yeah, I had a uh, an economics teacher in high school um, that was also a history teacher, but I had him for economics. Yeah, and uh, he always told us if you want to know about history, follow the money. Yeah, and. Um, and this is what it seems to be here. This is a this is an excuse to put pressure on Germany um, to cancel the Nord Stream pipeline a, and replace Russian gas in Europe with American U.S. gas. Yeah. Um, and also uh, to you know to prevent them from being able to bypass Ukraine. Yeah. Um, and of course, there was the story years ago that the that the Russians turned off gas to Ukraine and they made it out to be a political thing. Um, the, and it, there is certainly some politics involved. Yeah. However, um, the real issue or the primary issue, or at least the excuse was that Ukraine had no money and they had a huge debt for natural gas to Russia <laughs> that they weren't paying. Yeah. And so the Russians shut them off. <laughs> You're going to pay us now, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> or something. Um, or so, I mean, there's economic reasons for that too, and perfectly good ones. Yeah. Like if you're providing a service to somebody and they're not paying for it, how long are you going to continue providing that service? Exactly. Yeah. Um, so, I, you know, I just wanted to bring that up as, as something, something to pay attention to. Like try to find out, like see what... Um, what the pressure is about. Yeah. Um, and then look at who benefits and it'll probably give you a better idea of what's really going on. Exactly. And then the last one is, um, is there's a dispute in, uh, I mean, I guess you would look at it. You get, you remember where Asia minor, we don't really use that term anymore, but, no. um, Asia minor is the, like the Turkish peninsula, um, out there. Oh. and, Anyway, um, so there is a conflict right now in the Nagorno-Karabakh region uh, that's between Azerbaijan and Armenia. And um, this is interesting, first off, because it can lead to some bad stuff. Um, And secondly, uh, I think it's illustrative of why governments 
Suck. Enter into conflict. Well, yeah. <laughs> uh, it's just always my, my first go-to. Yeah. <laughs> enter into conflict. So um, it was absorbed by the USSR as part of Azerbaijan, uh, trying to balance out. This, it's also religious, okay? Okay. So um, a- Azerbaijan is a primarily um, a Muslim uh, region. Um, this particular area, Nagorno-Karabakh, is mostly ethnically Armenian and Christian. Okay. Okay. Um, so it was absorbed by Azerbaijan as part of the USSR to try and kind of even out the like to, te- to temper the, um, the Muslim influence in the region. Gotcha. Okay. And then of course the USSR broke apart and, uh, all these little republics became their own thing, including Azerbaijan. And, Around that time, and I, I got disputing information here, um, but around that time, like sometime between 1988 and 1991, um, this particular region, the Nagorno-Karabakh region, uh, de- play, declared itself an independent republic. Yeah. No longer part of Azerbaijan. Okay. Um, and like I said, it's their majority Armenian. Um, they didn't really fit with the Azerbaijan uh you know, Group. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and, uh, so, but now they're fighting over it again. Yeah. And, um, Azerbaijan has been launching artillery and rocket attacks. Uh, now Armenia has responded to this. They're, they're protecting the region to some degree, but they have responded, um, by, uh, launching attacks against Azerbaijan territories. Really? Um, now, of course, the people that are losing in all this are the people that live in the Nagorno-Karabakh region who, <laughs> right. who think of themselves as independent, but nobody else is accepting it. Yeah. And as far as I can tell, Armenia is not trying to claim it exactly, um, yeah. but uh, Azerbaijan is. And so Azerbaijan, though, is trying to <clears throat> to uh, limit the Armenian influence. And they're also, of course, I said that Armenia has been attacking Azerbaijani territory. Uh, but they claim that they're, it's in response to Azerbaijan attacking Armenian territory, like outside of the Nagorno-Karabakh region. They say that the Azerbaijani expanded the the area of conflict first. Yeah. Um, and uh, so here's the 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 part where the international um, treaties and agreements start to create some potential problems in the long run. Yeah. Um, is that uh. Russia has a defensive pact with Armenia. Yeah. Um, so if Azerbaijan is attacking Armenia proper, um, there is reason for Armenia to call on Russia to come to, to their come aid. Help. Yeah. yeah. Um, now Turkey is siding, and this is again, I think this is why I say religious might be a, uh, an important part of this. Yeah. Um, Turkey, a Muslim nation, yeah. uh, who also has some historical issues with Armenia, you may know about, <laughs> yeah. um, is siding with Azerbaijan. Yeah. And of course, Turkey is a part of NATO. Yeah. Um, so they can draw all of us in. Right. Yeah. Against the Against Armenia Russia. Russia. <laughs> yeah. yeah. This this could not go well. <laughs> yes. Um, so hopefully we kind of ignore Turkey. I don't, you know, we'll see. Yeah. Like, um, yeah. How how serious do we take Turkey when they come calling? But the so here's the issue, and here's the part that I want to that I want to focus on for the purposes of this podcast. I mean, I do think it's important that the people out there know that no, this is this, happening. This is going on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and this has been going on for more than a week now, like really heavy so artillery is, yeah. um, and rocket bombardment. And uh, they're using drones and all kinds of so stuff. It's so it's building then. It's not, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's not something that's going to go away. Doesn't Probably seem not. likely right yeah. now. Um, yeah. Both sides have kind of rejected any kind of peace treaty. Uh, although they initially they rejected any kind of peace treaty. Um, Azerbaijan is being intransigent about it. They want, um, uh, Armenia out of what they consider to be their territory, but this all right. So, but this is the point: the people in the Nagorno-Karabakh, the the disputed territory, they don't consider themselves a part of Azerbaijan or Armenia. Yeah, they consider themselves a, an independent republic. Yeah. So, what that brings us to <laughs> is, why is it that a government would try to enforce itself upon a people that doesn't want them governing it? Yeah. Uh, 
resources got to be the answer. There's got to be something there they want. Yeah, that's exactly it. Now, I don't know. And that's just know. true with government everywhere. Like, I mean, and that's that's why I bring it up. Yeah, exactly. Is I mean, that's what does government ever really want? And that's access to resources. That resource can come in many forms. Usually it's taxation. Yeah. Here in the U.S. Mm-hmm. I well, mean, and everywhere else, actually, too, pretty yeah, much. I would imagine. Um, but. And that may be the only thing that they're after here. Uh, is the you know the tax income? Yeah. Um. I, there are probably some natural resources that are of value. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, that's and that's the point is that I, the only reason that a government would uh, enforce itself on a people that doesn't want to be governed by that government is in order to access the resources of that territory. Yeah. No, it makes nothing but sense. Mm-hmm. And Which they're clearly willing to do by force. Yeah, I was gonna say something to keep an eye on too, mm-hmm. for sure. And that's all I really have about that. Um, we're actually right up against an hour now, so nice. Well, uh, we went a lot longer than I thought. Had yeah. a lot to say about the debates. I mean, yeah, it when was, it came down to it, it was it was a crazy, crazy mess. That that yeah, but it was it was like I say. I mean, it's important stuff. I guess. It is. Um, and if you haven't listened to it a second time, I recommend you do because you'll get a lot more out of it once you... you're not shocked by how it proceeded. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's, that's a good way to put it, actually. Yeah. yeah. Um, and in the end, while I thought that both candidates did poorly, um, I actually, I think that Trump won. I think he won today. Um, and like I say, and I, in many ways, Biden won too, just because he didn't collapse. That's and, true. In his campaign with mm-hmm. that debate, because I thought for sure he would. <laughs> yeah. That's the reason I was so into trying to watch it live, even though I had so much stuff going on that night. <laughs> When's he going to fall apart? Because I wanted to, like, I, I wanted to see it live if it happened. <laughs> like when, I, <laughs> when he uh, did the Humpty Dumpty thing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. <clears throat> So. Oh well, yeah, didn't get to see that uh, that wreck after all. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see if we have any more debates with mm-hmm. the co. I think the COVID things the real stand in the way. Yeah, it's too bad. Um, I mean, they could do it uh, remotely, remotely potentially. Yeah, but that's dangerous though because it there's is. already a lot of talk of like muting microphones and stuff, mm-hmm. and that makes if you're doing like a Zoom thing or something, that makes that a lot easier for the mainstream media to just control what's heard and what's not heard. That's true. Um, and that's, that's that, true. and that's the reason I'm against the whole them being able to do that is because you don't want the, of all people, the mainstream media, like CNN or somebody to mm-hmm. be able to control what voices are heard and what, which ones aren't. That's true. Even, even on a live stage, you could manipulate some of that. Mm-hmm. So, and that's the other thing that would have been interesting with this particular ba- debate. Um, part of the reason it may have came off so awkward and cringe is because you didn't have the crowds there. Yeah. Like, so on their normal debate, a lot of that would have been, a lot of the interrupting wouldn't have been so off-putting because there would have been crowds joining mm-hmm. in in different parts, and you didn't have any of that. Yeah. It was just quiet, other than Trump. <laughs> <laughs> So. And Chris Wallace. And Chris, oh yeah, yeah. He was. He, I think he was the worst offender as far as that goes. Yeah, but I, that's I, just I my opinion. Right. <laughs> All right. Well, um, let's wrap it up. We ended up doing this a couple days later than we had originally planned. But yeah, we're gonna get back on schedule soon. Um, I know you've had stuff going on. I've yeah. had work. So schedule at this point for us means once a week. Yeah. <laughs> right now. Yeah. We'll, Sometime between Thursday and Sunday, we will do a show. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Um, so we'll be back in roughly a week um, and uh, when we finally get this right. And in the meantime, try and stay free. Life's short, live free. Ciao. Later.